You gotta understand the enemy's not the man, it's the mindset. Killing my people, the sinner similar to COVID. No sense. How you take a life without a motive? Tired to see in protest, I ain't to see progress. For the person that'll win in the end, doesn't really matter what's the color of the skin. When the bullets scatter, when they bleed from within, haven't we shed more blood than these tears? Everybody, welcome again. Thanks for uh, coming to uh, part two of uh, Shop Talk. We've kind of titled this Lights Camera Discussion. Um, today we're going to unpack a, a few more things of, about what's going on in the world. Um, we're going to talk about Black Lives Matter. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the perception of the young black male um, in America. Um, and we're going to talk about racism and what that looks like and kind of unpack all those things. So um, that's kind of where this discussion is going to go. Thanks for being here. Um, Thank you. you guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you. you. Appreciate you. Uh, Larry here is going to help uh, kind of guide the discussion and, and we're going to just go from there. Well, the, the, I think the first issue that Damien mentioned is uh, what is the perception of a young black male? Mm -hmm. So how about if we start with the panelists that fit that description? Yeah, so, so we're going we're gonna to talk about, so he said, uh, the perception of the young black male in America. Um, I had the honor of, of working with uh, Ms. Cheryl here some years back, about five years ago, um, and we started an initiative, a group called The Community. Um, and uh, we, we wanted to change the view of the young black male. If you want to speak on that even, uh, or just that topic, you know. Certainly, no, thank you, Damien. Thank you for, for uh, just bringing us all together. Um, so let me say first that I am uh, the, one, the mother of one beautiful caramel colored son. And uh, yesterday was his birthday. So as you can imagine, I've got, uh, had a chance to witness up close and personal what it's like for a young black man in this country, in our state of Ohio, et cetera. And, uh, and so in my role um, with the local community college and being responsible for a satellite location, the, the folks, while I have a heart for everyone, the folks that I were especially drawn to were young black men. Um, and so, we gathered, uh, reached out to a number of, of young black men in the community, uh, invited them together and uh, a few area leaders to talk about um, being intentional about elevating the perception of young black men and also being intentional about connecting them with the power brokers in the city, right, so that they could learn how the system works and be mentored and supported so that their brilliance could be realized in the marketplace. And uh, we did that thing. We met every week, every week for a year. We covered a host of topics. Those young men were sons to me. And, uh, and if I could just share this story, when word got out to so everyone who heard about it was just was thrilled about it, wanted to be a part of it. And we got an invitation to be on um, Focus, is it right um, for uh, the, the that uh, broadcast. And so I said to them, you all have to show up suited and booted. And so we made everybody had suits. A couple of them rocked three piece suits. <laughs> And, uh, and they represented because that's what it took, right? And so they went and interviewed. I wasn't with them. I just, I was like the proud mama back watching them. They interviewed and handled their business and uh, shared what this initiative was about. And afterwards, we went to a local restaurant. And I said to them, you know, when you show up like this, it catches people off guard because they don't expect it, right? It was powerful. Right? <laughs> so we walk in, like, and it was like slow motion, right? It was slow motion, like time slowed down. People were stopping by. So, so, so who are you all with? True story. <laughs> and, and, and so who, what, what, what business, what company are you all just in town visiting? I kid you not. The manager of the restaurant came by and introduced himself, he did. did he not? He did. If there's anything I can do for you all, dessert is on me. And they looked at me and said, did you set this up? I was like, no, see, that's that's because they're not used to this. They've got you pegged one way, and they don't know that this exists. And so it's like an anomaly, right? 
And, uh, and after that, you know, our conversations changed. I'm, I'm saying this for a reason. Thank you for letting me share because being the mother of one son, the burden that I carry is for all young men who could be my sons to be respected, to be honored for the majesty in their humanity and to have an opportunity to excel and realize their human God-given potential. And so tonight is significant to me because this young man is like one of my sons and here he is holding it down. <laughs> A model for the world. You know, thank you. Uh, feel free, you guys, to weigh in at any time, you know, about anything. I know. want to weigh in on the topic at hand as far as what people see when they look at black people, as far as me as a black man. Uh, I got dreads, so that's a, you know, red flag to some people. But when you get to know me, you know, I'm pretty cool, pretty chill. But I think the biggest problem starts with blacks as a community, as a whole, because we portray each other in a way that make it, kind of acceptable for other people to like do the same thing that we doing. So we get mad if a white officer kill a black kid or a black guy or whatever. But in turn, we turn around and do the same thing. Like I go to your hood, blast Tyrone, Tyrone come looking for me, you know, in my hood. It's just like, it starts with us. And I'm not saying that the, the officers that's doing this stuff to, you know, blacks are right. I'm not side. I'm just saying we are no better than the people that's actually doing the killing because we are contributing to it because we don't stand together. And when I say stand together, that means every race. Everybody needs to come on the same page and, you know, stand together. And I think the world will be better. But my biggest problem is like when somebody look at me, they think the negatives. But they don't know that I'm the same guy that fought for four kids, got custody of my kids, but they don't talk about that. They just talk about, oh, he got dressed, his pants sagging. He look like a thug. He look like a thug, but I won't hurt a soul, you know? And I, I just love everybody. I like to spread love. And I just think that's what the world need in our community as blacks. I'm going to single us out again. As blacks, we have to fight for each other and each other is everybody. That's black, white, that's everybody. We need to fight for the world because we got kids looking up to us and our future is depending on them. So if they see what we, if we keep on dishing it out, the negative, if I want to fight Elijah because he got on this shirt, he should have wore red, that's, that's ignorant. And that's how it happens, you know. So I just think we need to like just bring the peace with ourselves and you know just everyone, everyone basically. So that's my take. I on think it. perception is a, a big thing. Uh, e, I'm sure you're like way in on some of this. Um, I see you over there nodding your head and kind of giving in, but uh, perception is a is a big thing. I love for Kai. I, I trust my kids with Kai like any day of the week, you know. Love him like a brother, regardless of of that negative perception people may have of him. Like you said, they don't they don't talk about the guy that struggled for over a year fighting for his kids, has custody of his four, went to barber college, didn't have a job for nine, 10 months, got it, got through it. Got, he has custody of his four kids, you know? They all live, he has a house now, you know? I'm, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you, but, that, but we don't talk about that stuff, you know? There's a lack of highlighting, like the positive that's in the black community. Um, you really, it starts early, you know what I mean, in school, you know what I mean? You take, Somebody, a kid, a black kid, in, uh, let's say Mansfield Senior, who's taking honors English to, from ninth grade on, he, at some point he's going to talk a little different than his buddies who don't take those classes. You know what I mean? So all of a sudden it's the, you talk white. You talk, white. Yeah, you talk right. white. You know what I mean? Like, nah, man, I'm, I'm educated. My mom made me do homework. You know what I mean? This isn't a, this is the goal, right? This is what we want. We want people to be able to articulate our, our issues. You know what I mean? Because if we can't speak to where the, the, the common tongue, well, you never can get anything done. And I think that's a big issue in our, especially in schools. Right. You know what I mean? Because that black on black crime starts way earlier. You know, the, what we talk, perceive as violence, it's not just a gun or a fist. Right. You know what I mean? It's some verbal words. You, when you're in school, when you eighth grade, and someone's saying, "Oh, you sound white," or tenth grade, that's violence against each other. You know what I mean? That the, the violence has to stop early. You know what I mean? So we got really, so we talk about, you know, change happens at home. It's just not white families needing to talk about race at home. It's black families. Hey. You support that kid that's in the honors English or wherever the, that class may be or where the case may be that you don't you don't vibe with because of X, Y and Z. You're in the, you're an athlete or you're in band or where the case may be. We know how clicks happen in school because that's the way kids are. 
But it's a matter of, hey, understanding that being able to appreciate the differences of others at an early age. You know what I mean? Because once you get to 22, 24, it's a lot harder to reach them and to make that change. You know what I mean? The, the change starts early. So you know, got four kids, and you understand what that's like as far as being in the school and that being a smart kid. You know, what I mean, being an athlete and all that stuff. So you know, I think the more we're able to you know reach our kids early about the important issues, because guess what? In this day and age, when the kids can look on their phones and see the world for what it really is, there's never a time that's too early to let them know what's really going on and how you really need to treat people, and particularly certain segments of people, populations. So. I just think that's a, a big deal, you know, and I run into that at, at work every day. You know, I work on the majority white campus in the majority white town. Yeah. I want a football team, so our, 50, our team is 50% black. Ashland University. Ashland University. Yeah. And, um, you know, so a big thing for me is teaching those kids how to interact in that environment. That's a big deal. And, you know, a lot of my kids, I'll get, I recruit Cleveland, so I get some inner city Cleveland kids, you say a kid from Glenville or wherever the may, case may be, he's never seen as many white people in his life that, weren't, that wasn't a teacher. You know what I mean? So. Now, on top of that, now he's looking at all white cops everywhere in town. He walks is white, unless they're with the football team. You know, and you may only get along with, and I say get along, where you want to see him outside of the locker room with about 25, 30 percent of the team. Right. You know what I mean? So those of you who have been in the locker room understand that. And so all of a sudden that kid feels lo- alone and isolated. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it's the being able to find the beauty and the difference early. Yeah. You know, and that's really exposure. The big. Yeah, yeah, exposure. Exposure yeah. and education. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? That's, that, that's big. You know what I mean? Expose them. They need to be exposed to different things. I was blessed, man. My grandma took me on trips. I've been a ton of places before I left high school. You know what I mean? So I'd seen other people and I'd seen other cultures. And, you know, I know how many of my friends were not afforded that opportunity. You know what I mean? I can still come back and talk to them because they still haven't left a lot of times. And that's, you know, it's not sad, but it's like I didn't, and me, I didn't come back and educate and attempt to expose. You know what I mean? This is, and that's something when you leave, because everyone, you, you got to get them right. Everyone can be LeBron and leave. You know what I mean? <laughs> but but what, do you, what do you do, though? He came back. He came back. He came back and exposed. You know what I mean? He's taking kids places. He's showing them a different world. And I think that's the big thing. Everyone doesn't have to be a millionaire. You can make, you know, have a great job and your family and come back and reach and be a part of what you guys did with those young men. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't take much to expose. And then you can educate. I think it's critically important to distinguish between what we as a community of black people, how we need to evolve for our own selves in self-care and love for one another. That, that's, that's a separate conversation from systemic and institutional racism. So, so the, I'm just saying this out loud because I don't want someone who's watching this to think to, to get the two mixed up and think that systemic and institutional racism is because black people don't know how to care for themselves. So that's a, that's a generalization that does not that serve it, okay? So please don't get that twisted because that's, that's not even it, right? So, so we, could, we could talk about that by itself and have a private family conversation about how to take care of one another. (laughs) I do not want people to be confused. No, yes. (laughs) One is a symptom of the other. In some ways. I I would say, I could... Yeah, that was a conversation. Know. Yeah, no, let's let's focus on the thing. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's go back to Damon, if I can. Um, the idea of black young black men. I mean, the idea of masculinity. And I know as a as a father of a, of a black and white family, and I don't know how far I want to go into this, but um, over thirty years, I I have watched how, how do I speak into his life or their life as as a white man, knowing that when they were in school. The issues that they had to face are you, you know, is, is Tupac my model or is Ken Blackwell or Clarence Thomas? The tension of what does it mean to be a black man? And it, that's, you know, that, and I think it's even very confusing in our current culture for all men. What is masculinity? And, and you know, we, outside of this, we could have a whole co- different conversation about God's view of masculinity and, and just how does that look? But I think that's part of the confusion. And when you see the absence of, of fathers, that then speaks into the good work that you, you did, Cheryl, to lead this through. But it's still 
men speaking. That's how, how a boy becomes a man is he is another man speaks into his life, you know, speaks into his life, his father, hopefully, and shows him how to step up and lean into the difficult things. And that's missing in so many different places in our community for all sorts of reasons. Yep, yep. Um, I think it's, so even like thinking about that, I think about like my, my dad, my dad spoke last week. Um, some of those conversations are tough conversations. And so you, you know, as, as a white male with black, black children, correct? Um, it's, you know, how, how, how do you have that conversation with them? Like, are you saying what's right? Are you, I don't know, you know, like, I think, you know, just, just really well, just. Right, and even <laughs> through the process, it was interesting. The conversation at that time from the state of Ohio was we had to come up with a cultural identity plan. And my first response was I'd give him a mirror or give them a mirror because I, I'm not sure when you try to define out these things because race is something that we construct. You know, we, it, I don't know when it happens, you know, maybe three or four years of age, all of a sudden a child knows by looking in the mirror, but I think the first time, I think based on what I learned at home, is I'm brown. And then when the neighbor child says, no, you're black, all of a sudden there's like, wait a minute. <laughs> You know, and where does that come from? And then as a you know, trying to lean into what I thought was a conversation that was going in one direction. Now, you know, I thought we were done with COVID was like, okay, we're going to get back to some normalcy. And now, I mean, I mean, take what happened in Atlanta. Just and th this is like, okay, wait a minute. How can we have one conversation with thousands of people pushing in one direction to say we want to bring about awareness. And then on the other hand, this thing still keeps happening. And that just breaks my heart. I don't know what to do with that. So you, you talk about that a little bit, you know, just, you said you probably shouldn't have watched that video. Oh yeah, I felt, right defe I felt completely defeated today. I like went into this because Damien and I have talked about this out uh, for years now, um, kind of doing this shop talk and then this is kind of the perfect time. So speaking on Atlanta, I watched it today. Um, I'm sorry. Way too close, way too, uh, I, I should have watched it like tomorrow. <laughs> Not going into this conversation because I felt defeated. I mean, you know me as a white person who grew up in Colonel Crawford and then to Hillsdale. I live in Ashland currently. Um, I, I have open eyes to everybody. I've spent time in Cleveland, inner city. I have some of my best friends live there. So I go into very urban areas and I, I, my eyes are open to that. I think the problem is, is a lot of people aren't. Um, which we'll get into when we talk about the Black Lives Matter, like the movement, because you see a lot of the All Lives Matter, which irritates me because I think it's just a lack of people not wanting to open their eyes. We know All Lives Matter, you know, but um, I don't, I just felt defeated today watching that. Um, the video, I'm sure people will watch it and we can address it real quick because I'm sure it's like the hot topic right now. Um, the, the problem I have with that video is the fact before anything happened, he was asked, do you have weapons? And he was searched. Um, and it was for a DUI. So to me, that's unnecessary. Um, I don't care if someone runs, let them run at the DUI. Like, but I, that, that thing, an unarmed man, that should not be the right, result. Right, but let me just go back. I mean, you the know? idea of a, a gentleman who's passed out in his car. Right, right that's what I mean. Yeah, right. I mean. I want to know his story. I mean, one of the things that's been happening in our community is this whole trauma-informed care conversations we're having about really understanding not what's, you know, what's happened to you. Yeah. You know, why are, are you, in, why is he passed out? And I'm going to guess, I, could, I can guess some things, right, right. Yeah. but okay, so then how do we as a community, and then how do we get our folks in law enforcement, who I love and, and want to protect and honor to actually, care there could have been people. a different outcome. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's happened to my friends, the exact, that, I mean, they drank too much and they were hungry right. and they fell asleep before they ordered. I mean, <laughs> I mean, in my friend's cases, I mean, it's happened. I mean, I don't know what the story is. I just felt very defeated watching that because I had already watched, you know, everything else. And, um, you know, I just felt kind of defeated because sure. like you, I don't know what the answer is. Well, this is it. This is a kind of community conversation because you think about it. I mean, I was sharing with Cheryl. I, I had a conversation. Uh, I've had a couple of them, actually, because I'm trying to learn. I thought I understood this stuff. I mean, I worked at the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. I, I hung out with guys like Clarence Thomas and Colin Powell, and I thought I had a pretty good perspective. But then realizing how, what a mess we really have and, and the outrage on the other side of it. I mean, it's just like, it's bubbled to the surface and the pandemic actually created that opportunity. And now it's like, we, ha we can't miss it this time. Okay, I mean, it, it's, it was 354 years and then we got to the 60s and, and, and the idea that as 
I, as an as adult, my, when I, I, let's see, when I was born, my, my, my children couldn't have voted because they weren't allowed to because of the color of their skin. And so this is an experiment, right? And we're still trying to figure it out, but we now have this incredible opportunity to actually have conversations about what matters and realize that, okay, and I don't know how to do reparations. I don't know how to say, I don't know how to get back to a normal in that regards, but how do we build, because when I was in Kenya a few years ago, all the young men and women I met there, they all want to come here because it, they believe in the land of opportunity. Now they don't understand the backside of that, <laughs> you know, but they understood, and particularly I was there during the Obama years, so they saw what President Obama represented to them, which was opportunity and progress, and that yet when you look at today, it's like, oh my goodness. Right, there's a whole other side. Right, right, so conversation and relationships is huge. Pastor Mikey, you talk about how life moves at the speed of relationships. Um, no, that's that, a good line. What is that? I mean, that that yeah. that like stuck with me from the first time I heard it, you know, with you. And how can you like tie that into to to this, you know? Yeah, I mean, I I've used the that statement for years. I think there's an element of love God, love your neighbor. So I think it originated with with God. That life moves at the speed of relationships. I, I think when God wants to do something great in our lives, he'll send a relationship. I think a lot of times when the enemy wants to distract us or deter us, he'll send a relationship. I want to simplify it, but I think it's hard to heal. I think it's hard to heal if we don't have the right relationships, even somewhat symbolic of, of this room, that I, I'm already picking up on, you know, Reggie's story. And I love hearing about the house and your kids and, you know, I left last time, Elijah and Cam and stuff. I left last time, couldn't even fall asleep thinking about Cam telling me, pull over for 90 minutes. And so, you know, I think this is really important. I applaud what you're doing and bringing people together. I, I, I could agree with Sarah that sometimes when you look at all of it, it can be demoralizing. Yeah. Like, where do we even start? But in your words, I want to listen and learn. Uh, I may not be able to solve the whole world, but I want to do something. Uh, so I think relationships matter. And, you know, I've known UD for years now and love your family. I, I think I just think it's important that we continue to sit at, you know, what my pastor would call the table of truth. He calls it the table of truth. And both sides not only need to be willing to speak the truth, both people have to be willing to hear the truth. And if either one gets up from the table, then the table of truth comes to a, a halt, a stop. And so although we're at a barber shop, uh, I, I do think this is a table of truth and it's at least a good start. So, you know, I, I wanna listen, I wanna help. Well, I, I really liked what, what Reggie said. I thought that your personal life experience has shaped you in ways you can't even really appreciate until like when you're talking about your grandma taking you, you know, to various and, and just exposing you to much more of the world. I think that is so important. And I th when, in your position too, I'm assuming you recruit mm -hmm. for Ashley University. So you probably have a chance to see kids from so many different backgrounds and how that affects their attitude before you, if you're able to get them to come to Ashley University. You know the diversity that they're going to see when they see it when they come to Ashland University compared to where they have come from can be dramatic in some cases, and how that is going to affect the rest of their lives. It's funny you say it. Like with my job, like I'm able to get around and I, recruiting is building relationships. You know, you want someone to come to your church. It's about the relationship that you're able to build with them, even if it's minuscule um, to a degree. And so for me, and I think I hope a lot of other coaches do it. I make sure I. For me, it's making sure that they know the environment they're getting into. You know what I mean? Because it's a complete disservice to me to take a young black kid from East Cleveland and bring him to Ashland, Ohio, and not tell him what right. Ashland, Ohio is. Right. You know what I mean? And so that's why you you won't you'll have a certain percentage of those kids leave. You know what I mean? And it's and it's not their fault. It's not Ashland's fault. It's just the culture shock of being in that situation. Because um, guess what? You're going to be watching Walmart a lot more. The police are going to stop you up more often. Um, your professors on campus are going to give you less leeway. You know, I mean, I was my first paper ever. I was accused of plagiarism. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's 
and I ended up graduating from that place with an MBA. So it's, you know, it, those things happen, but, you know, as long as you know what you're in for, the fight that you're in for, you know, because we have these discussions going on right now on campus, I'm sure you know, and um, it's just one of those things that kids need to, A, be aware, that's the first thing, and then B, once we're able to be aware, we're able to, now at this point, this COVID and everyone's having these discussions, then you, no matter what, you have to listen to what's said online when it's coming from some place at this point. Because um, there aren't there aren't face to face conversations like this is the first face to face conversation I've had with strangers in a while. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, now people are having to listen to those stories. You know, you're having to hear about the kid that you know what someone in nursing school said to this young young lady from Nigeria, um, and all the things that are happening right now. You know, it's yeah, my perspective, my grandma gave me an opportunity to do that, but it was more so I could relate to anybody and I could help these conversations be fostered. So question on my end, and again, I shared last week, you know, I'm born and raised in Canada. My wife's from Ohio. So when I hear you say, you know, we're going to expose them, the Walmart, the police, the test, the plagiarism stuff. So how, how five years from now, 10 years from now in recruiting, how do we make some headway? So it's not just bringing awareness to, hey guys, you've got a much more of an uphill battle than others like how how do we make improvement with that walmart world that police world that professor world that's, you know what i mean yeah that's the education and you know top down when you talk about the mayor you know our mayor in ashland Mr. mayor miller i believe is his last yeah. name matt miller yes. uh, i believe mayor miller's matt miller told us that you know since there were no black lives lost at the hands of police in ashland there was there wasn't an issue that he had and that, right, to me, was the most, excuse the language, most damning thing I'd heard that entire night because it's not a matter of if it's happened yet. Like, the key word was yet. You know what I mean? We, it hasn't happened yet, but there's not, nothing saying that it couldn't happen. You know, so you, the idea is that we need to educate, and it's not just a licensure course here, a certificate of uh, completion for diversity training here. You know, there needs to be serious systemic change. 